when I first joined CBS, actually, working the early morning shift, I opened up the network 6 o'clock in the morning. But believe it or not, I never even knew how to make a station break when I got <laughs> to the network because all I did was do football games in college. Other fellows made the station breaks, and I didn't know anything at all about radio. And Later on, they switched us over, and um, Bert and I primarily handled the dance band shows, which was your 11 to 1 Prime time, let us say. That's right. Instead of like the Tonight Show, you did dance bands in New York. Sometimes you'd, they would switch out to Chicago or San Francisco or Los Angeles, but primarily most of your great bands were playing in and around New York City. We used to get a kick out of alternating doing Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller. Look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. Gillette's Cavalcade of Sports is on the air. From Ebbett Field in Brooklyn, Gillette presents the exclusive play-by-play report of the fourth game of the 1949 World Series between the New York Yankees and Brooklyn Dodgers. Good afternoon, baseball fans everywhere. This is Mel Allen with Red Barber, greeting you for the Gillette Safety Razor Company, maker of world-famous Gillette razors, blades, and shaving creams. Yes, and it's because so many of you fans use these products. By the time Mel Allen broadcast Game 4 of the 1949 World Series at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn on October 8th, the world was in turmoil. The Yankees would win that day and take the series four games to one. But people's attention was turned towards world politics. This series, there's a big hand for all these Dodger stars of 1916. And Miss Gladys Gooding is playing all Lang Syne. Jeff Pepper, Knapp Rucker, Zach Wheat, Otto Miller, Chief Myers, Rube Marquardt. Boy, names to conjure with as you look back through baseball history. And those who were unable to attend today, Jack Coombs, now baseball coach at Duke University, Duster Mails, now doing uh, work on the West Coast, Fred Merkel, first baseman, now living in Daytona Beach, Florida. No longer living, our manager Wilbert Robinson of that 16 team, Ed Appleton, a pitcher. The Communist first People's baseman, Republic of China was formed on October 1st and recognized by the USSR the next day. The Democratic Republic of East Germany was formed on October 7th. On October 14th, 10 Communist Party USA leaders were sentenced to jail time. Two days later, the Greek Civil War ended with a communist surrender. And on October 24th, the cornerstone of the United Nations headquarters was laid in New York. The Red Sox in the 14th inning. Babe Ruth, who won the 2-1 decision, passed on last year. And Sherry Smith, who pitched for the Dodgers in that game, also passed along recently. And now the lineups for today's game. For the New York Yankees, Phil Rizzuto leading off the shortstop. As 1949's holiday season approached, India adopted a constitution, while the Labour government was defeated in Australian federal elections. A growing Red Scare was now deeply embedded in the media. Alger Hiss's second perjury trial began in November, while Mahatma Gandhi's assassins were executed, and Chinese communist troops continued their march to Taiwan. Members of the media had been claiming there were potential communist cells in the entertainment industry for more than two years. Radio writer Don Quinn expressed his feelings at the time. You said that this was a... I didn't have to answer a question. Well, you don't have to listen to this answer either. But, oh. <laughs> but uh, there was a recent blast in the newspaper by, I think, Senator McCarran, charging oh. the, that the Radio Writers Guild was red-dominated. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Well, I think it is pure hogwash. Senator McCarran is a politician, and all politicians will do almost anything for a vote or a headline or to perpetuate themselves in office, and I think this charge is pure nonsense. I've known these writers for many, many years, almost a great many of them personally, neither in council meetings or membership meetings has politics ever arisen. Oh, really? It's one of the two taboo subjects. The other is quality of radio shows because other authors, your friends, are present. We don't discuss each other's shows. Oh, yeah. And And you do uh, not discuss politics. We do not discuss politics except 
where legislation is pending concerning the welfare and status of writers in general. Oh, yes. This is the only thing the Guild is interested in, is the status of writers and their welfare. And the fact that there are probably, as in all organizations where you have six or seven hundred members, there are probably a few communists. But they certainly do not dominate the Guild. As a matter of fact, I don't think I know any. And I know a lot of these men personally. Mm -hmm. In the first place, the chances of a subversive attitude or line or script reaching the air are highly remote. Not many writers are communists because they are independent thinkers and the Communist Party does not welcome independent thinkers. These are individuals. Granted that they're all shades of political opinions, and a great many of them are liberals. This does not make them communists in my mind, because I'm a liberal myself. To get a subversive line on the air after going through production men, advertising men, mimeograph girls, engineers, uh, network authorities, continuity acceptance, this would require a collusion on the part of all people, which would be utterly fantastic. Yes. And I think to get uh, communistic ideas, either on the screen or on the radio, are very remote. <laughs>